In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. Therefore, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 21 verse 23. Matthew 21:23. Now this is, begins the second day in the temple. And there are going to be three parables. We'll study two tonight. We'll be getting out early tonight. And we'll study the first two. And these parables denounce religion. So this is the second day. And our Lord had just, uh, remember, physically removed a lot of people from the temple. And now He's going to take a different tact. He's going to put the gloves on and start to fight that way by using parables. But in these parables, He is going to actually rip the religious crowd apart except he'll have gloves on. And then in the, uh, the last part that we'll study Sunday, he takes the gloves off and just uh, really lambastes the religious crowd, and that's what needs to be done. So some principles we need to note from these parables is the fact that Jesus Christ is about to make a full frontal assault on the religious leaders. And what's going to happen is they're going to try to discredit the Lord at every turn, and he knows it. Uh, They disguise their discrediting him uh, by asking questions. And they really don't want an answer to the question. They just want to humiliate the Lord. But the Lord's a genius. He is the Son of God. And He is going to turn it right back around on them. And they'll they'll be walking around with their feet in their mouth for years after this. So we'll see our Lord being heckled. But then we'll see our Lord heckle the hecklers. And he'll re- he's not going to let them run right over him. And uh, we all see pictures of Jesus Christ or hear of Jesus Christ as being someone who turns the other cheek, who uh, just pats people on the back. But uh, the fact is that he's the Lord Jesus Christ and no one's going to run over our Lord. He has a message, a purpose, and he's going to fulfill it. And so he's going to turn it right back around on the hecklers. So nothing could be further from the truth that our Lord was weak. He was very strong. We noted that yesterday. And the reason why is because he's attacking religion. And the only way to get through to religious people is to be very bold, to be very dogmatic, and to just show them who they really are. And they don't know who they really are. When they look in the mirror, they see a saint, yet they're all destined for hell. And this is a part of tough love on our Lord's part because He doesn't want them to go to hell. But He has to make it clear to them, Hey, look, buddies, you will go to hell unless you believe in Me, unless you get rid of this religion which is shrouding your way of salvation. So He has to be tough. And in fact, a few of the religious people will believe because He is so tough and makes it so plain, yet most of them never will believe. What we're going to get out of 21:23 is the fact that the religious people are always rude and vicious. They're rude. Our Lord's speaking uh, to a crowd who are interested in what He has to say. And then the religious people just uh, are rude and interrupt Him. And it just shows that they're rude. Extremely rude. If you don't like what's being said at a church... Just sit there silently and don't come back. And that's how you handle it. But the religious people are so stuck on themselves, they're going to create a ruckus. And the reason why is because a lot of the people had been sucked away from the synagogue. First of all, they were sucked away from the synagogue to see John the baptizer. They didn't like that. And now the Lord comes along and they're all sucked out of the synagogue uh, listening to the Lord. And they don't like that either. And they begin to question his authority because uh, he doesn't have a degree. He wasn't ordained by the synagogue. And they had no control over him. And it, it really bothered them. They were terribly bothered. Therefore, they became very rude. And the worst things that have ever happened in humanity have happened. They've had their roots in religion. 9-11 was all about some religious nuts 
Religion is an awful thing, not a good thing. Christianity is totally separated from religion. But religion and legalism are not relaxing to be around. If you're around a legalist, and neither are, you're not going to be relaxed and they're not going to be relaxed because legalists try to run everyone else's business. And they're going to try to run the Lord's business. And He has some business to take care of and they're going to interrupt Him. So in 21:23, now after Jesus entered the temple courts, the chief priests and elders of the people came up and interrupted him. And from the Greek it says they kept on interrupting him. See, our Lord was teaching, and they would just, uh, someone in the crowd who was a legalist and a religious leader would pop up and say, by what authority are you doing these things? And the fact that they kept on doing it meant that the Lord ignored them for a little while. And so he would keep teaching and then someone else would pipe in. By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? So many people kept chiming in asking this question. At first he didn't answer. That's where we get from the Greek the fact that they kept on asking him until he would give them an answer. Kind of like today George Bush uh, was heading to Texas. And it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. But he was going to Texas and the reporter said, uh, don't you think you'll be getting in the way, you and your entourage, by going to Texas? And uh, George Bush kind of laughed at it because it's a stupid question. And so they kept badgering him with that question. Won't you be getting in the way? And then he would try to answer, and in the middle of him trying to answer, they would say, won't you be getting in the way? And they're just editorializing. They're not really asking questions. They just want to make him look foolish. And he had a pretty good answer, and he just laughed so that it would show that they really don't mean much to him, and they're really insignificant twerps. And so were these religious people, constantly interrupting the Lord. By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Finally, Jesus is going to give them the answer. And he's going to answer, he's going to ask, he's going to answer them by asking a question. That's a rhetorical technique. That's a debater's technique, and it's very effective. Especially when our Lord does it. He does it perfectly. And he's really going to put them in a tight spot. Because he says, Jesus answered, I will also ask you one question. They've been badgering with them, them with the, him with questions, so now he's going to say, all right, let me ask you a question. If you answer me, then I'll also tell you by what authority I do these things. Our Lord knows what's going on already. He knows they're not seeking information. If he knew that they were seeking information, he would have answered them. But he knew they weren't seeking information. He knew that they were simply trying to discredit him in front of his sheep, in front of the crowd. They were trying to steal his sheep. And they're wearing a big smile, I'm sure. And they're trying to cover up. They're like a sheep. They're like wolves in sheep clothing. And they're trying to cover up what their true intentions are by asking a question. So our Lord now uses a debater's technique. He asked them in 2125, where did John's baptism come from? Now remember, John the baptizer, he wasn't very liked by the religious crowd. Yet the religious crowd had to go along with it because everyone at this point thought that John the baptizer was a prophet. And he was even more than a prophet. And so uh, he asked them about uh, John the baptizer. And the reason why they didn't like John the baptizer was because, uh, do you remember, in his ministry he was no less uh, kind to them as our Lord is, and that is in human terms. Because John the baptizer would look them straight in the eye and say, generation of vipers, nest of snakes, rattlesnakes. And uh, a lot of the people would say, you don't do that from the pulpit. You don't call me a name from uh, standing there and call me a name. Who are you? But it was needed, and John the baptizer did it. And so they had no love for John the baptizer, but he brings him up because they're afraid of the crowd, and they're afraid because the crowd believes John the baptizer is a prophet. So he asked them, is it from heaven or from men? So instead of answering him, they had to go into discussion to formulate a good political answer. And they were pretty smart because they said, if we say from heaven, he will say, then why didn't you believe him? And they would have said from heaven because the crowd 
uh, wanted uh, the crowd knew that uh, John the baptizer was from heaven but they couldn't say that and if they say from men we fear the people for they consider John to be a prophet but if we say from men we fear the people for they consider John to be a prophet so religion is not going to answer our Lord's question because religion always fears what people think the criteria for them is not what is truth. The criteria, criteria for them is what do people think. It's not even what do they think. They don't think John the Baptist is a prophet any more than they think the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God. But they're scared of what the people think. And it's a sign of apostasy when churches become more concerned about what people think than what the Word of God has to say. And a lot of pastors may even know some doctrine, but they're not going to teach it because they're concerned about what the people think. And they're concerned that their congregation will swim out. Of course it will. You'll be chewing, you'll have to step on people's toes. It's going to happen. And so, but because they're scared of what people think, they do not consider the Word of God more important than what people think. Therefore, they fail in their ministry. Even if they have five to 10,000 people all their life, they still fail as a minister, and they're not living in the light of eternity. They could have had a lot greater reward with a smaller church who was willing to listen. So they're scared of what people think. So they answered Jesus. We are not able to say. And this is funny. He sets him up. Because remember, he says, look, if you uh, answer me this question, I'll answer the question you're asking me. Pretty fair exchange. So they answered Jesus, we are not able to say. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. He trapped them. Now they, they were seeking to trap the Lord and he traps them. Principle, you can't trap the Lord. You can't bribe the Lord. Uh, you can't be a smarter than the Lord. They thought they could. So immediately afterwards, you see everybody now is standing there stunned because he has just taken the most educated crowd in Israel and humiliated them. They're the educated. They're the people everyone looks up to. They're the ones with the degrees. Doctor or rabbi so-and-so who has studied for 50 years and knows all the Hebrew, the whole Torah. And Rabbi so-and-so was just dealt a blow and humiliation. So the crowd is no doubt shocked, and the religious crowd is no doubt, no doubt even more shocked by the fact that they were trapped. Nobody's ever trapped them before. Uh, everyone just accepted them as the arbiters of truth. But they're not. And the Lord traps them. And the whole crowd is shocked. So immediately our Lord goes to the parable of the two sons. He goes to a parable so that he'll refocus the attention of the crowd. And he's going to start talking about a story so that they'll start thinking about the story that he's telling than uh, the fact that he had just ripped apart the highest people in the land. So 21-28, he refocuses them by saying, What do you think? You see, he's trying to get their brains going again. What do you think? Plus, it gives them a chance to take a little credit for it and say, Hmm, let me think about what he's saying. A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And now he's using parables. This is like uh, putting the gloves on, as I said. He's still going to punch them hard, but it's going to be with gloves on, and they're not going to see it coming. That is, the religious crowd is about to get punched hard, uh, rhetorically speaking. Later he takes the gloves off, but now he's kneeling in parables, uh, just so that they'll think about what he's saying, and they'll get into it, and before they know it, they're being insulted, and finally they catch on to it. The boy answered, I will not. But later he regretted what he said and went. There are two different words for repentance in the Bible. Metanoiao and metalmetalmai. Metanoiao means to have a change of mind. Metalmetalmai means to have an emotional response. In fact, this is metamelamai, regret. But later he regretted. He felt bad about what he said. He told his father, I will not. 
And notice the Father doesn't push anymore. This is a reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once someone's volition comes into contact and their volition says no, the Lord doesn't bother bother with them anymore. And this is, this is the indication from the parable because the Father doesn't even chew out the, the Son for saying, no, I will not go. But later he regretted it, an emotional regret. He was emotional when he said, I will not. He had other things to do and he didn't feel like it. So since he didn't feel like it, he said, I will not. And then later he felt sorry for what he had done and then he goes and does it. The father went to the other son and said the same thing. This boy answered, I will, sir, but did not go. And this one answered, and not only did this one answer, he answered with much respect. Now, if you were the father of both, up until this point, you would say, one of my sons is lazy, and the other son is very respectful. But the case is going to turn out to be just the opposite. And he said, I will go. I will, sir, but did not go. The principle is this one gives lip service only. Just as the religious crowd gives lip service to God. God is close to their lips but far from their hearts. And they're always the Lord willing. This is the same as they do today. And this religious crowd then always had a holy vocabulary. The Lord willing. God willing, I'll do this. Amen, brother, hallelujah, praise God. All, the, all that phony language that they used to look spiritual. This is a, a picture of them. Because they speak with their lips, yes, I'll do it, Father, but then they don't. And it's lip service only, much as the churches today, it's lip service to God. I like to call the crowds that go to church on Sunday, nod to Godders. They just go to church to nod to God and say, Yes, God, I know you're there. Hello. And then for the whole rest of the week, forget about it. Nod to Godders. And that's all they do. Once a Sunday, lip service. And it, that doesn't impress the Lord any more than these religious people impress the Lord. So 2131, Which of the two did his father's will? They said the first. And they refers to not only all those in the crowd, but also the religious leaders. They don't even know that they're being set up. They're being set up by a parable and they don't have a clue. And the religious people are probably the first to speak up because they want to be known as the most knowledgeable. And so they, the Lord asked them a question and all the religious people in the crowd, the first. The first, of course. Then Jesus said to them, See, they're all excited they know the answer. They're expecting praise probably because they answered him correctly. But then Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Tax collectors and prostitutes will enter the kingdom of God before you do. He just punched them. He set them up. They answered his question. It's kind of like punch and counterpunch. He asked them a question. They punched back with an answer, but they missed. Then the Lord punches back, counterpunch, hits them straight in the nose. It's a wake-up call for them. They've always thought of themselves as holy. They've always given lip service to God. And now he tells them, the tax collectors and prostitutes whom you gossip about all the time are going to enter into heaven and you all are going to hell. Well, it shakes them up. And the reason why tax collectors and prostitutes had no illusion about uh, Christ and no illusion about people is because uh, the tax collectors and the prostitutes knew all about people. They, they had experience with all different types of people. And they realized that everybody's a sinner. And some of the prostitutes had no doubt uh, lain with some of the uh, religious crowd. And probably they'd had sex with some of these in the religious, religious crowd and they were supposed to be the best in society. And the prostitutes say, ah, oh, they're no better than anybody else. It's all phony. And so when the Lord comes along, since they understand people, it's very easy for them to recognize God. They have no illusions about people, no illusions about themselves. They know, too, that they're sinners because they're ostracized by society. The others have a hard time thinking of themselves as sinners because no one's ever ostracized them. They've always been the top-notch people in society. No one has ever questioned their actions. 
But the tax collectors and prostitutes, everybody's on their case all the time. So when the Lord comes along and offers a solution, they latch on to it immediately. Furthermore, it's harder to a witness to people who are religious than to a prostitute or a tax collector as they were described in those days. In 21.32, For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and prostitutes did believe. He's still insulting them. He's still looking at them and saying, Tax collectors and prostitutes believed, but you didn't. Although you saw this, you did not have any regret about your decision not to believe him, not to believe to believe John the Baptizer concerning Christ. They had no regret about their rejection. It means they what this means, it is the emotional word metamelami, but what it means is they never gave thought to it again. They simply rejected what John the Baptizer had to say, and they didn't even give thought to it. Now some people might reject reject it at first. And then later on, maybe a week later, something happens to them and, they've, uh, and they come back and they say, you know what, I've been thinking about what that man said. I've been thinking about what John the baptizer said. But these people weren't like that. They simply rejected it and put it out of their minds and never even thought about it again. Complete rejection with no regret. So they had just been slapped upside the head. And now he moves on to the parable of the tenants. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented it to tenant farmers and went on a journey. You remember this from Mark. And uh, we'll go over it in Matthew. Matthew has some things to say about it as well. 2134. When the harvest time was near, he sent his servants, that would be prophets of the Old Testament, to the tenants, the people of Israel, to collect his portion of the crop. But the tenants, the people of Israel, seized his servants, beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Out of this we have pictures of Jeremiah, Elijah, and all of those who were persecuted by the Jews. Then he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them the same way. Israel was always rejecting the prophets, always rejecting doctrine. Finally he, sent, he, he, finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants, the people of Israel, saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. A picture of what's going to happen to our Lord Jesus Christ. 2140. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? So he asked again the crowd. Uh, Many in the crowd, religious leaders. So he's just given a very simple parable. They don't know that he's talking about them as of yet. They think he's just telling a story. And so he tells this story about a horrible tenant who kills prophets and is going to kill the only son who's going to inherit it. And so they get righteously indignant, including the religious crowd. So they said to him, He will put those evil men to a miserable death. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his portion at the harvest. The other tenants refer to the church. So when he's going to rent the vineyard out to us now, and he goes on to talk about how some of them will believe and become part of the church. So he's setting them up here because they're giving a correct answer. And then in 21.42, Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the Scriptures? Uh, Here comes the insults. The rock the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is from the Lord and it is marvelous in our eyes. That comes from Psalm 118. We remember that. For this reason I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a people that will produce its fruit. The one who stumbles over this stone, Jesus Christ, will be broken to pieces. And the one on whom it falls will be ground to powder. 
That's the baptism of fire. And the uh, being uh, broken to pieces has to do with the rejection of Christ at the first advent. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they knew that he was speaking about them. Oh, they're geniuses. They finally caught on. Uh, they were all participating in the uh, discussion and then they realized they've just been ripped apart. So they wanted to arrest him but were afraid of the people because they regarded him as a prophet. So the religious crowd always worried about what people think and the religious crowd always trying to trap the Lord but the Lord traps them and by this time they're getting very frustrated. I told you it would be a short service. It's Friday night and, well, doctrine's important, but uh, sometimes we uh, need a break, I guess. I need a break sometimes from all the study and whatnot. So um, we will begin Sunday with the parable of the wedding banquet and uh, move on uh, to some wonderful things. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity to study this portion of the Word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us so that we can come to understand the importance of doctrine and that doctrine is far more important than what people think and that doctrine is something that will break legalism so that we might live a comfortable life of relaxation in the light of your grace. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.